Hello, everyone. Um, we have a very short session, so I am going to let Geraldine do most of the speaking. Um, it's, it's a very, it is indeed a very intriguing story, and Geraldine has spent the last few years uh, researching, meeting people, digging up uh, archives, and the end product is something that we hopefully will be able to read in English later this year. Uh, I first encountered the last Maharaja of Indore, uh, Yashwantra Holkar, when we published a book called Made for Maharajas in 2006. Typically, in the process of making a book, you decide on the cover right at the end. But in this case, the author, Amin Jafar, was very sure who and which uh, artwork he wanted on the cover, and that was Yashwant Rao Holkar, a beautiful portrait of his. Um, sorry, can you? Uh, it's there. Okay. Um, there. I hope you can see one of the portraits. And uh, that is how I discovered uh, this man who was one of the most important art patrons of his time, not just in India, but also internationally. But there's very little known about him here, and I'm so happy that Geraldine has um, decided to make him the subject of her latest book. So, Geraldine, let's begin with this painting, um, because this is where your story begins. Tell us about your first encounter with Yashantra Holkar and why, who you call the most important collector of his time. Hello, everybody. Um, so this is a painting, uh, if you can see on the screen, this is a painting of the last Maharaja of Indo, uh, made by a French very well-known artist in the 20s and 30s, Bernard Boutet de Montvel, who was a um, jet-setter painting at the time. Um, and you have, uh, so it was uh, painted in 1928. The Maharaja is 20 years old. He's a student in Oxford, um, and uh, the pose has been done in Paris in the artist's house, which also happens to be his studio in a very fashion quarter of Par Paris, uh, Paris Saint-Germain. Um, this painting, the first time I see this painting was in, was in the 1990s. I was uh, starting... Uh, to work in the art market as a specialist, and I bumped into this painting, and I was immediately intrigued um, by the man who looked Indian, but everything else was Western. And if you go deeper into um, this painting, you, you would uh, actually, I don't know if you see here, but he's not looking straight at you, he is looking on the side, and there's such a melancholy in his eyes. Uh, and it's a very disturbing portrait. He's a slender. He actually uh, doesn't look like what in the West we imagine a Maharaja of the time. He's very slender. Um, he's, he seems very shy. Um, he exudes a fragility and a, a gentleness that really contrasts with the image of uh, authoritarian and showy and flamboyant uh, side of uh, the image of Maharaja that we had. Uh, so he didn't match, actually, with the image of a Maharaja. So this is... Um, an image that I kept for more than 20 years with me. I was really fascinated uh, by this man who actually was the most important collector of Art Deco in the world. Um, and nothing was written about him. Uh, there was, he was one of the most important ruler in India at the time. He was the last Maharaja of Indore, which was the fifth most important state at the time. He actually was the most important collector of Art Deco in the world. Uh, he was known internationally. He brought modernity to India. And there was no biography, no monography, not even exhaustive text on him, just a few articles, mostly Western, and only focusing on him as patron of the arts. And when you know that he collected only 10 years of his life, 
it's very short in the life of a man, and nobody actually knew how he became the most important collector and what happened afterwards. So there was nothing before and after. We only talked about him about 10 years of his life. So I think it was a very reduced and Western vision of the man. Um, so the purpose of this book was actually to bring an Indian angle to him and to really uh, look at his whole life uh, and the historical background. He took power uh, when the British Raj was here um, and he went through independence. Uh, so there were so many things to say and to understand about the man. So it all started uh, with uh, this painting, which was actually the first works of art that he collected uh, and that kicked off his whole uh, artistic adventure that lasted uh, 10 years. Uh, I didn't realize he was only 20 in this. It yeah. makes it all the most, more remarkable. He was friends with the photographer Man Ray and the sculptor Mancusi. How did these friendships forge? And I think in your book you also talk about what an important part his first wife played uh, in his, um, as a patron of the arts. So if you could tell us a little bit about them. And there is a photograph of them. If we can have that up, please. Thank you. So this is a uh, photograph taken by Man Ray in 1930 uh, in Cannes, in a hotel in Cannes. Uh, so you see the Maharaja and his first wife, who was uh, Indian. Uh, on this picture, so he's 20, 21, and she's 13. Um, and uh, I chose this picture. It's the cover of the book because it tells you everything about uh, the man. Um, it, it, he was not a single collector. It was a couple uh, collector. So he, as some of the Maharajas of the time, were sent by the British to study in the West, in London. So he was sent when he was uh, seven years old to study in London. This is his first encounter with the Western culture. And then he was sent back again uh, when he was a bit more, when he was a teenager at Oxford. And he had a tutor who was Belgium. His name was Marcel Hardy. And it happens that Marcel Hardy was this kind of Nimbus professor who was fond of avant-garde thing and modernity. And he had uh, tons of friends in the West, mostly in France and Germany, who were in this avant-garde and modernity trend. So his tutor uh, started to introduce him to collectors, artists, to bring him to uh, artist studio, thanks to Henri Pierre Rocher and many others. So thanks to his tutor, he entered an artistic world, the most avant-garde uh, environment at the time in the West, and for the Maharaja, uh, it was kind of an escape from who he was and what uh, he had to do in India. He took power when he was a teenager in a very dramatic uh, conditions and somewhere against his will. He was, he, he was, he was not made to rule. He didn't want to rule. What he wanted was freedom. Um, so through art, he found this freedom. So we are in the late 20s, so it's the beginning of the Great Depression, uh, and he's very audacious because he's very young. Uh, the situation, economical situation in the West is uh, catastrophic, and this is exactly the time uh, that he chooses to build the most modern palace in the world. So this was his vision. Uh, so I found it incredible. It has never seen before. And still today, he's 
palace that he built in 1930 uh, is uh, seen as the iconic building for Art Deco. Uh, and all the furniture that was inside uh, is also seen as the most important furniture of Art Deco. So this man, very young, had a great eye, great taste, and um, even today, if you see pieces that are sold at auction that come from Manic Bag, uh, most of them uh, achieve world worldwide uh, record. Uh, so, uh, that, actually, that was my next question. Do we know where these suites of furniture and some of the artwork is today? Are they in private collections or museums? Um, so most of uh, the interior of the, the palace was sold in 1981 uh, at Sotheby's in Monaco. Uh, it sold very well at the time. Uh, so then it was scattered out uh, throughout the world. Uh, and there is uh, one man, uh, especially, who uh, uh, thought, I mean, the, the, who, who really connected and uh, became passionate about him and spent his whole life uh, looking for every piece, every work of art that belonged to him. Uh, so now the collection is in Qatar, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's in the hands of the Altani uh, family, um, but it's in private hands. Okay. Um, we're running out of time. I have so many more questions, but um, let's just, you were born in Madagascar. You grew up in China. Your first book is about um, one of the most influential and also very interesting Chinese art dealers who, and so there are certain parallels between that story and this story. Both of men are sort of fading from public memory. What are some of the themes that you look for? Why did these two stories interest you? Is it about this confluence of cultures and identities? If you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I've always been uh, interested in um, double cultures, multicultures, and how uh, a human being uh, go through that and behaves. Uh, so the last Maharaja of Indo was of great interest for me. Uh, because he was actually Indian, but spent most of his life in the West and uh, Western culture. He married uh, two American ladies after Usha that you see on the picture. Um, and uh, what is of interest is uh, who was he actually? Uh, was he Indian? Was he Westerner? And how he uh, went through all those historical uh, dramatic events that he went through. Uh, First World War, Second World War, the independence. Um, how did he react? Uh, uh, and this, this is what is of interest uh, also in this book, is you can see the historical background behind and uh, what uh, the psychology uh, of a man, and uh, how did he integrate those two cultures? Did he integrate them or not? Uh, and in this book, uh, it, it seems that those two cultures that he was in since he was a little boy, um, he, he was quite lost, actually. It didn't bring him good. Uh, he couldn't choose, and he was not really at ease um, going back and forth uh, with those two cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have time for questions from the audience? Or Okay, one, one question. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful presentation and a synopsis of what's there in the book. Uh, my question is that, uh, uh, you know, there were many contemporaries of, uh, you know, Yashwantra Holkar also, uh, who had a similar, you know, upbringing uh, so did you uh, try to, you know, compare their life with him? And uh, for example, Dilip Singh, right? Uh, he was also kind of English educated and uh, um, also, uh, you know, the Maharaja of Patiala, basically. So did you try to have a comparison of uh, the different kings uh, within India uh, with his life in the book? 
So you're right. Uh, some of the rulers at the time, uh, not all of them, but some of them were sent also abroad in the West uh, to study. The British wanted to make them uh, British uh, people, uh, British gentlemen, so they thought that they would uh, behave uh, more easily. Uh, which actually didn't turn out uh, that way for everybody. Um, but uh, the last marriage of Indo is very different. Actually, he's very unique uh, compared to the others. Uh, the picture that you see here from Man Ray, uh, he's the only one who has been shot by Man Ray. And all the artists at the time in the West worked for the marriage of Indo but only for the Maharaja of Indo. So you have to, the, the Maharaja of Indo chose France and Germany uh, as a country to collect and to dig into because the UK at the time, he was feeling uh, like he was feeling in India. He was all, always um, uh, in surveillance uh, so he wanted to be free, he wanted to be anonymous, so he found those, this freedom in France or uh, in Germany, uh, and this is where at the time the most important artists uh, were. So Le Corbusier, Hélène Gray, Man Ray, Brancusi, uh, you name them, they all worked for him, uh, we are in the late 20s, uh, it's the crisis, economical crisis. The artists has, have no more patrons. Uh, they, they are starving. So they are looking for new patrons and wealthy patrons. And it happens that exactly at the same time, this 20, 19, 20 years old, very wealthy prince comes to Paris and wants to build the most important palace. So they all jump on the occasion and uh, work for him.